place to be. Blessed place to be with the guys. Oh, guys night out. Love you guys. So glad to see you. How many of you guys are new? Right, new guys? You just made a great decision. Can we welcome all the new guys? Really glad to have you new guys. So I'm Pastor Mark. We're really honored and excited to have you. And let me tell you, we're going to get into it tonight. But first, we got something coming up. First ever Real Men Conference. We do our weekly get together coming up uh, in a little bit, right after Easter. We're going to have our first ever Real Men Conference. We're going to do it on a Friday night. We're going to pack this place out. Bring your buddies, bring your enemies, uh, bring your daughter's uh, idiot boyfriend. Uh, bring him early, uh, taser him, make sure he's here. And uh, I'm gonna teach and we're gonna do uh, baptisms and altar call. We've got um, a great worship leader with Stephen uh, McWhorter coming in and a friend of mine, Matt Lindland. He was a uh, US uh, silver medalist in Greco-Roman wrestling also fought in Pride and UFC and was a wrestling coach for the US Olympic team. We're gonna bring him in, talk about mental toughness for men. Okay, so we'll see you guys. Are you excited about that? That'll be our big blowout to end the semester. Be a Friday night. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're in the little uh, series called Spiritual Disciplines for Regular Guys. And the point is this, men have, ha we all have habits. Every man has habits in his life. And the question is, are they healthy habits that are, helping him or are they unhealthy habits that are hurting him? And uh, there were some new statistics that came out this week from the CDC and others. And just, just think of this for a moment. The average single guy today, so any of you single guys? Single guys, single guys in your 20s, okay? You're in the right place, bring your friends. They're idiots, we're here to help, okay? So single guys in your 20s, here's what we know. 68% uh, of guys in their 20s today are not dating a woman, not intending to date a woman, have no actual interest in a relationship with a female and are making no movement toward marriage whatsoever. In addition, um, the majority of young men for the first time in our nation's history are living at home with their mother. In the last few years, um, a lot of young men just moved home with their mother. They have no intention of ever moving out until they can find a girlfriend in her 20s or 30s with a good job and low expectations. And then their hope is to move into her house and have her pick up where mom left off. In addition, young men today are not in the workforce. This is the highest percentage of able-bodied young men in the history of our country who have exited the workforce, are not working a job, and have no intention of entering the workforce anytime soon. The number of young men who have zero friends is at an all time high. So just being here tonight, I'll tell you what's gonna happen. There are people around you and you're gonna get to know them. That is a miracle. If you don't believe in miracles, you're gonna witness one tonight. Men are actually gonna talk to each other. In addition, what do you think guys, young guys are doing with their time and energy? Porn, social media, Video games, the beast, the false prophet, and the antichrist. That's what they're doing. In addition, um, this is a crazy stat. Uh, in 1983, so 40 years ago, 80% of guys 18 and older had a driver's license. Today, it's down to 60%. And they're saying at current uh, deterioration, it won't be long that the majority of men 18 and older do not even have a driver's license. How many of you, that's, how many of you, how many of you men like freedom? Okay, how many of you like freedom? I, I got a car at 15 and I drove myself to my job without a driver's license. I was driving before I had a license. I, I don't know about you, if you're an 18 year old guy or a 20 something year old guy, you have no driver's license, you have no girlfriend, you have no job, you are living with your mother and you're online complaining about what other people are doing, you should assault yourself, okay? <laughs> because you don't have the right to go online and judge anyone for what they're doing because you're doing nothing. Now this is also, and what these are, these are generational curses and bad patterns that are destroying young men, destroying young men. And today, uh, young men are an endangered species. And everything in our culture is to absolutely remove their masculinity and to ruin their legacy. 
And so the only thing that young men are doing more than young women is killing themselves. The suicide rate for young men is four times higher than young women. What I'm telling you is this culture has for us a lot of habits, all of which don't come from our father, but from the father of lies, do not lead to life. They lead to death. It's not working. And the good news is we wanna be God's sons and we want our father to give us some habits by which we could be healthy and make progress and be respectable, responsible grown men and have a life that we're proud of and have a legacy that we're excited about, amen? And so that's why we're here. We're here to build up men to bless women and children. So that brings me to the series. And the spiritual disciplines are these healthy habits. Let me say this. Men who don't know God, they've got habits. We wanna have different habits, healthy habits. And we're looking at how God pours into us and then we pour out to others. You men have responsibilities. Some of you are students, some of you have jobs, some of you have wives, kids, grandkids, ministry, you're constantly pouring out. God wants to pour into you as his son and then you can pour out to others. So we're gonna deal with two things tonight. Um, journaling, which is pouring in and service, which is pouring out. So when it comes to your Bible, and if you, if you don't have a Bible, let your table lead know. We're gonna give you a Bible, amen? We're gonna put God's word in your hand. Entire books of the Bible are largely journals. For example, Jonah is a guy's journal. The Old Testament books of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, those are Solomon's journals. Esther is largely uh, the story of a journal of someone's life. Job, Lamentations, and Ruth are all largely journal entries. In addition, large sections of the Bible are journal entries. Large sections of Nehemiah, Psalms, Proverbs, John, and Revelation. So what I wanna talk about is first and foremost, journaling. And most men don't do this, but they should. And what this allows you to do is to prepare to then go live the life that God intends for you. You can journal um, by writing a song. You can journal if you're a creative uh, through artwork. You can journal um, if you're a creative through video or through audio. There's just different ways of capturing sacred moments and teachings in life. Now, what I do, I'll tell you about my journal and I'll tell you that this process has literally changed my life. I'll explain my journal to you in a moment. I carry this everywhere I go. It's my backup brain. If I don't wanna forget something, I write it down. If God says something to me, I wanna capture it. If somebody needs to be prayed for, I wanna make sure that I make note of that. And if I have something to do, I wanna make sure that I'm obedient to that. So here's some different ways to journal. And what I like to do, I like to just write it down for two reasons. One, they say if you get a pen and write it down, your brain actually retains the information. Number two, I know that the Chinese are gonna hack my phone. And so I like to write it down. And if it's not the Chinese, it's gonna be the Russians. Either way, they're gonna get in there. So I like to write it down. But here's what you can do when you journal. Uh, first one is process life. How many of you men right now, you're in the middle of your life and you're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Like, what decision do I make? Uh, how do I interpret this? Uh, what's, what am I supposed to make of this? God, where are you? Journaling is kind of place where you process it. You think it through. How many of you, you don't get your good ideas all at once, but you get them bits and pieces throughout a day or a week. So you collect it. And I'll explain how you do that in a moment. In addition, you can write a processing letter. What happens for men, we don't know how to forgive. We don't know how to let things go. We don't know how to unburden. So we carry it and we get angry and stressed and depressed. Most men who are angry are really just very burdened and they don't know how to get the burden off them. Some men who are very broken and emotional, they just are carrying burdens that they need to find a way to release. Here's what a processing letter is. It's a way of journaling. And it literally is just sitting down with God praying and writing out, okay, here's what happened. Here's where we're at. Here's why I'm frustrated. And then spending time processing what happened, praying and forgiving. Now with the processing letter, number one, you don't post it on the internet. You know somebody's bitter when they have an open letter. There are things in your life and there are things in your past that you can't fix or change, but it's not resolved and you can't let it go. Any of you guys know what I'm talking about? Your ex-wife, right? Your wayward kid. 
the boss who gutted you, uh, the person who betrayed you, uh, the church that wounded you. There's something in the past, like that wasn't right. And they, they, it's not fixed, it's not resolved, it's, it's open, it's still not good. And I don't know how to let it go. What a processing letter is, it allows you to process it with the Lord and then leave it with the Lord. Sometimes this can get very emotional. Like forgiving the dad who died without ever apologizing for being a horrible dad. This can be processing when you can't do anything about it. You know, your wife miscarries or your child dies when they're young or you're the dad who goes to the funeral of your kid. You're like, I, I can't fix it. I don't know how to resolve it. I, there's nothing I can do. A processing letter allows you to emotionally work it through, give it to the Lord, forgive, release, unburden, and then move forward with your life. And sometimes we need to do this. Some of you guys, there are people and things, they just continue in your mind. They're haunting you, they're tormenting you, they're frustrating you, they're triggering you. Sometimes journaling is a way to just process it. In addition, planning. Hey, how many of you guys, there's stuff in your life right now you gotta make a plan for? How many of you gotta make a plan for work, plan for your health, plan for your wife, plan for your kids, plan for your ministry, plan for your finances? You got plans to make. If you're a man, you should always be working on something, sequencing, strategizing, whatever's next. Journaling is a way to do that. Uh, I'll explain this in a moment, but in my journal, I've, got, I've actually got two different journals. I carry this everywhere. This first has a, uh, has a photo of me and my daughter. I usually rotate photos of various family members. This first journal is only for my family. It's plans. So I'll meet with my son. I've got a section for my son. All right, son, you're married and uh, you're doing ministry and your wife's pregnant. Like, how can I pray for you? I wanna write that down. What are you working on? I wanna write that down so I can be helping you. Uh, meet with my daughter. Okay, what's God teaching you? What are you learning? How's college going? I wanna make notes so that next time I meet with my daughter, I could say, hey, honey, I wanna follow up on this. What happened with that? Um, God told you this, and I wanted to follow up on that because I've been praying for you and I had some questions. So this whole section is just for my family. There's a section for my wife. Here's what my wife has learned. She has learned, hey, write that down in your book. That's what my wife has learned. How many of you, your wife tells you something, you're like, I, don't, I didn't remember. My wife's like, write it down in the book. My wife's got a page in the book. And she'll be like, pray for this, pick up the kids. Here's what I need you to do. Could you be praying about that? Or I'm studying this issue. Could you help me think it through? Or we need some time together, I'll write it down. The second section in my notebook, it's for, well, and in this section as well, there's stuff for my house. How many of you got home improvement projects? Need a list and a plan, a budget and a plan, a schedule and a plan. I put all those things in the first book for my family. My family, I think, feels loved because when they tell me something, I listen, I write it down and I follow up. In addition, I've got a second book. The second book, it's for my two jobs. I've got Real Faith and I've got Trinity Church. So this is my work. In there, I'll go into meetings and before I go into the meeting, I'm writing down everything I need to make sure that I bring to the meeting. Things I need to do after the meeting, I tend to write it down. Prayer requests for people, I put them in there and I pray for them. If God shows me something, I write it down. If somebody wise tells me, hey, this is a great book, I write it down and then I order the book. And so I, I keep this with me all the time. And then in the back of my notebook, and you can do whatever system you want, but here's the big idea. You need one system to organize your life and keep everything together. And you can't get creative and you can't get rest unless you free up some of your mental space. If you're always trying, okay, I can't forget that. I gotta do that. I gotta remember that. I gotta do this. You can't get a Sabbath mind and you don't have creative space for new ideas. So you need to collect them somewhere. And then in the back, what I do on the very last page, it's my to-do list of all the things that I need to do. When I'm done, I tear the page out and I make the next list. I find that planning for me doesn't come all at once, a little bit at a time. Like in here, there's a file, if I'm honest with you. So we've got five kids, they're getting married, they're launching, they're having their own families. So Grace and I are quickly headed toward empty nest, okay? Uh, and our, our youngest son is in high school, but he's gonna graduate in about a year. Well, now we're looking at what would the next, what would a good house be for us? 
Because right now, when you have five kids, you have a lot of bedrooms. Pretty soon, it's gonna be me and Grace. And unless we're fighting, we don't really need five bedrooms. <laughs> but you know what we're gonna need is a big entertaining space so that our kids and eventually our grandkids can come over. And we're gonna need some land for them to run around. And we're gonna need places for them to park their cars. How many of you live in an HOA? Let me just say this, there are no HOAs in heaven. There are none, okay, there are none. And here's, here's what I know about the HOA. As soon as I park outside, they yell at me. And, uh, and, and the point is like, I need to move. And so that's where we find ourselves. And so what we're doing now, what Grace and I are doing, we're watching those home improvement shows and we're looking at real estate and we're going to open houses and we keep having conversations about, oh, what do you like about this? What do you like about that? What would work here for the grandkids? And the other day she's like, you know, I think it'd be great if we had a bunk room for the grandkids so they could all come and stay over and have a big spot. And like, okay, so guess what I'm doing? Just writing it down and then praying. Okay, Lord, we'd like a space for our grandkids. We'd like a space to entertain. We'd like a space to have people over. Here's what we'd like. And so it's bit by bit, it's probably gonna be a year long process where I just keep adding to the file and Grace and I just keep talking about it, but collecting it. And what that does for me, number one, it gives me something to always be working on and looking forward to. In addition, as we're talking and learning, it allows me to gather it. Make sense? How about this? Um, autobiography, this is huge. How many of you wish your grandpa wrote his life story somewhere so you could know it? How many of you wish your great grandpa who was in the war, like wrote it down? Okay. Part of journaling can literally be, I'm gonna learn things and share things, and then I'm gonna give them to my kids and grandkids. Can I tell you one of the coolest journals I've ever heard of in my whole life? It's a buddy of mine, his dad is a pastor, and his dad was an orphan, grew up in an orphanage, and then he joined, I think, I think the Navy, he was in the military. Um, he fought in one of the world wars. He got married, had kids. He's a wonderful guy, great dad, great grandpa. What he decided to do was to write a journal for his grandkids. And what he did, he, it took him a lot of time, but every um, day, five days a week, he would pick one of his favorite scriptures and tell you know, what that meant. And then he would connect it to something in his life story. Like when I was a little boy and I grew up in the orphanage, here's what it was like. When I joined the military, here's what it was like to be 18 in boot camp. Uh, when I was deployed overseas and I was fighting the bad guys, you know, here's what God was teaching me. Here's where I got saved. Here's where I met your grandma. Here's the first time I held your dad. Five days a week, he was sending these little journal entry texts to his grandkids. How many of you, if you got that every day from your grandpa, when you were a kid, maybe in college, how many of you, that would have been like the greatest gift you ever got? And so what the dad did for the grandpa, he took all of that and he published it in a book with the photos. Now the grandkids know the whole life story of grandma and grandpa and all that God has done in their life and they know their family history. There are some great men in this room you're gonna meet some of the greatest men you'll ever meet in this room. And we like to say that we care about lives and legacies being transformed. How many of you, what God has showed you, what God has taught you, what God has delivered you from or led you through, it's going to die with you unless you tell somebody else. How many of you guys right now, you wish you could read your grandpa? My grandpa George died when I was 10. I loved him with all my heart. I have nothing but good memories for my grandpa George. He meant the world to me. And up in my office, I've got a, uh, a birdhouse that he and I made together when I was a little boy in his wood shop and we painted it. And I've got a little chair shaped like a bear with a little storage unit on it. And we cut that out on a bandsaw when I was a little boy, we painted it together. I've only got a couple of things from my grandpa what I, and I tell my kids the stories, but he died when I was 10. So there's a lot that I don't know. I wish more than anything, now that I'm gonna be a grandpa, just so you guys know, I'm gonna be a grandpa, which is awesome. I'm looking forward to it. 
I wish I could hand our kids and grandkids my grandpa's story. And I wish they could know more about him. And I wish I had more about him that I could share. Okay, how about some other reasons to journal? Uh, collecting thoughts and ideas. How many of you, you don't think in a linear sequential way, you get sort of sporadic insights and you learn things and you grab bits and pieces through the day. How many of you, you're like, I'm brushing my teeth and now I got an insight for my job. And now I'm driving to work and now I got an insight for my wife. There's a place to collect all of that. In addition, a listening prayer and or a prayer journal. I'll explain both of these. Listening prayer, there are certain things that I just, I just ask the Lord about. Like, Lord, I don't know. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do that? And so what I will do, I will literally journal out my prayer request to the Lord. And I will schedule hours of silence and solitude and I'll just get with the Lord. And I will pray and I will listen and I will write down what I believe the Lord is revealing to me. The whole, you know how we ended up in Arizona? A day of listening, prayer and journaling. I went to a small town in the middle of nowhere, it's called Waterville. It's now kind of an abandoned small town. And I told my friends and Grace and our family, I don't know if we should stay where we're at or go. I don't know what God would have for us. I don't know if I'm done with ministry. I don't know, I have so many questions because we were in that pivot place of life where everything we were doing sort of came to an end. It's like the bridge got washed out and you're like, okay, I guess we're not going that way anymore. Okay, where do we live? Where do we work? Where do the kids go to school? What do we do? So I just literally wrote down my prayer requests and I just spent a whole week just saying, Lord, I'm gonna meet with you. I scheduled an appointment with the Lord. I went up to Waterville and I've told some of you guys a story. I was like, I just prayed and I walked and I listened. And when I felt like the Lord was saying something, I wrote it down. And because of that, you guys are here. I've never done men's ministry in a local church in my entire life. I've spoken at men's conferences. God led us to Arizona. God led us to plant a church and God told me to focus on you men. That's why we're here. Now, and it all started with, hey, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he was like, you're gonna move, plant a church, serve the men. Okay, that's what we're doing. In addition, a prayer journal. We always kept a prayer journal with the kids at our dining room table. We'd get together for dinner. Some nights we do, you know, open the scriptures, have a fun conversation. Sometimes it was, what was your sermon takeaway? And sometimes it was just hanging out and having fun, being a family. But we kept a journal on our dining room table and what we would tell the kids is, hey, do you have any prayer requests? I guess what we do. We'd write them down. And then when the prayers were answered, guess what we do? We check them off. My kids spent their entire upbringing seeing God answer prayer. So they all of a sudden now they're looking for prayers and they bring them to the dining room table. They're like, oh, uh, so yeah, my friend, his dad's got cancer. Put it in the book. Okay, we'll put it down. But then what that allows us to do is number one, to follow up next time it's dinner and you have those awkward dinner times. They're like, I don't know what to talk about. Just like, all right, hey guys, anything we can be praying about? Hey, let's check the prayer log. Has God answered any of those prayers? You guys need to know that there is a special prayer log that we kept before we planted Trinity Church and we would meet as a family for dinner and the kids would come up with prayer requests. They said, uh, Lord, we want a building. Lord, we'd like to all do ministry together. Lord, we're gonna need a sound system. Uh, Lord, we wanna have a fun kids ministry. Um, Lord, we wanna have a men's ministry. We literally at dinner started putting everything down that we were praying for. And guess what? You guys are here. God answered all those prayers. And it built my kids' faith. My kids are like, well, of course God answers prayer. Like we have a record of God answering prayers our entire life. And how wonderful would it be if at your dining room table, there was a prayer journal of answered prayers. And as your kids got older and their faith wavered, or they wondered if God was real, you could be like, hey, just, you know, this was your life. Just God's been in it. Just look. And how many of you would love to have that record to show your grandkids one day? 
Hey, here's where we were praying that one day your mom would get married to a guy who wasn't a loser. And then here's where she met your dad. And then we prayed that they'd have a baby and then they had you. And, and see, God answered our prayers. Journaling is how you connect a lot of your other spiritual disciplines. And what it does, it helps you to remember and it helps others to join in the joy, okay? So that being said, uh, what happens then you, let me say this too. Uh, one of the coolest prayer journals I've ever heard of, there was a guy one time, uh, some years ago, he came to me, he was around 20 uh, and he really wanted to get married, but he wasn't quite ready. He's like, I really want to get married. He's like, what can I do? I said, well, you got to get a job. You got to move out of your parents' house and get off the payroll and you know, take responsibility for yourself. I said, but you know what you can start doing? You haven't met your girl. I said, you can start journaling for your wife. He's like, well, I don't know who she is. I was like, you will. I said, when you're thinking about her, write a prayer. When you come across a scripture that reminds you of what you want for your marriage, write it down. When, when God is causing you to really long to be married, write that out and how you're feeling. And so this guy for years did that. And, uh, and then he met the girl that would be his wife. And you know what? She was a new Christian. And he realized the reason that God had me wait is not because he was punishing me or I wasn't ready. He had a special daughter selected for me that he was gonna save. And she was a single mother. And as soon as he proposed to her, put a ring on her finger, what do you think he gave her? A journal. Here's what he said. I've been praying for you and thinking about you long before I met you. Here's how I feel about you. Here's how I've been praying for you. And guess what? There was an entry in that journal where he said, Lord, if she's a single mother, then I wanna be a good father. He got to take that page and show that little boy, I never met your mother and I never met you, but God one day laid on my heart that if it was a single mother and I could be a dad, that I would adopt them and I would be their dad. So I'm your dad, you're my son. And I prayed for you, you know, seven years ago. And I'm so glad to meet you. How many, how many of you guys, if that guy came to your house to meet your daughter, that'd be a good day. He's like, I, I love Jesus and I've been praying for your daughter. Would you like to read all the prayers? Oh yes, yes, yes. The last guy just had a lot of DUIs. So yeah, I'm very, very <laughs> grateful, very grateful to meet you. And let me say this, some of you guys are, you have a hard time communicating or being emotional, use a journal. I just, I'm way off my notes. I know one guy, he, he struggled to articulate to his wife how much he appreciated her and loved her. So guess what he did? He kept a journal on her bed side on the nightstand and he would write letters and prayers to her and things he was thinking. Guess what she did the first thing every morning? She read it. It's, it's a treasure. They've been married for a long time. She's got now stacks of journals. I prayed for you, I love you, I'm sorry you're sick. I shouldn't have fought last night. I'll be home tonight um, and it's gonna be awesome. So stretch out, you know, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I'm watching Cirque du Soleil and I got a few ideas. So, you know, uh, but whatever it is, kind of their fun little journal. Is it, you guys get the heart of what I'm talking about? Okay. okay, then once you hear from the Lord, then it's service. So God speaks to you like, okay, what am I gonna do? So I'll summarize with this. Uh, here's serving, Philippians 2, five through 11. Once God has told you something, then you go do it. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, meaning he is God and has all the attributes of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. The greatest man is the greatest servant. Therefore, to be a great man, you must be a great servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he, he humbled himself. Men, here's what I will tell you. Life can humiliate you, but only you can humble you. Life has humiliated me, but life has never humbled me. Only a man can humble himself by becoming 
obedient. He did what he was supposed to do to the point of death, even death on a cross. We love Jesus because he served us by dying on the cross in our place for our sins and rising from the dead so that we could be adopted as the father's sons. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. If you wanna be great, you need to serve and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so for us as men, let me make this my final point. You wonder, what does a great man look like? And our, our, you know what our world has no idea? The answer to that question. Our world has no idea what makes a great man. We have no standard, no prototype. We have confusion and corruption and addiction and foolishness. As Christians, we're so blessed, we know exactly what a good man looks like. His name is Jesus. God became a man. It's like, okay, well, be like him. And there's the prototype. That's the perfect prototype is Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes as a servant to serve. And what service is, it is humble love and action. You're not humble unless you serve. You don't love unless you serve. Love is not just what you feel, it's what you do. God so loved the world that he gave his son. If you love, you do. Jesus is our example. And what's interesting, there were two occasions in his life that were two of the stupidest conversations in the history of the world. One, um, there was an argument among his disciples about which one of their group was the greatest. Can you imagine that? That had to be weird. Like, you know, the guys are arguing, Jesus walks up. Hey guys, what are you arguing about? Uh, try to figure out which one of us is the most awesome. You're like, well, my mom's a virgin. I created the heavens and the earth. Probably me, you know, I'm probably not you. Uh, but what he doesn't do, he doesn't rebuke them. He redirects them. I always find this curious. What Jesus doesn't say is, don't aspire to greatness. What does he say? If you wanna be great, serve. If you wanna have a great marriage, serve your wife. If you wanna be a great dad, serve your kids. If you wanna be a great employee, serve your company. If you wanna be a great church member, serve your church. Right? If you wanna be great, and here's the problem. Oftentimes in the church, we tell men, well, be humble, don't aspire to greatness. No, aspire to greatness by being humble, by serving. So Jesus tells them, you wanna be great, serve. And he says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. This is what's so hard because our culture says, the greatest men are the men who are served. And Jesus says, the greatest men are not the men who are served, but the men who serve. How do you know where to serve and when to serve and how to serve? I'm telling you that that's journaling, making your plans for your wife, your kids, your family, your job, your vacations, whatever the, your retirement, your grandkids, whatever the case may be. And saying, okay, you know what? I have processed and prayed. I've sought wise counsel, I've talked to the Lord. Now I'm gonna go do what the Lord has asked me to do. A um, Couple of things, let's be honest, just permission to speak freely. What are some of the men, reasons that men don't serve? We don't serve. Sometimes we're lazy. Sometimes it's pride, like that's beneath me. Fear, what if I fail? And the truth is you're gonna, Fail, you're gonna make mistakes. Other reasons why men don't serve. Some selfishness, busyness. And let me say this, once you spend time praying and planning with the Lord, now you know where your priorities are and you'll do things in the order that God intends for you and you'll have time for the most important things. Part of it is, well, we live in a day when successful men like to employ others to serve them. I didn't mean to say this, I think this is prophetic and you can decide if this is from the Lord. 
we tend to think that the greatest men can afford to pay people to serve them. And we take that wrong thinking into our marriage and into our parenting. I didn't mean to say this, if it's prophetic, receive it. If you serve your child, that's better than any teacher you could hire for them. If you serve your child, that is better than any coach that you can employ for them. If you serve your child, that is better than any youth pastor can shepherd them. I praise God for teachers. I praise God for coaches. I praise God for pastors and youth leaders. But you know what, at the end of the day, no one has the impact of a father. And a father who humbles himself to serve, to bless, to benefit, he is a rich gift to his child. Because you can pay somebody to do something for your child or you can do it. You can pay somebody to do something for your wife or you can do it. We live in Scottsdale, Arizona, where most men believe this pervasive myth if I make money, I can hire people to care for my wife and kids. The issue is you're the most qualified and you're the most responsible. And it's an opportunity to love them. And it's an opportunity to invest in them. Let's just go back to Jesus. Did Jesus serve people? He did. Did Jesus even wash feet? Yeah, that was the worst job, by the way. Rock, paper, scissors, feet. It was the worst job. You wore, you wore open-toed sandals. The streets were dirt. They were traversed by animals. They're full of feces and mud and blood and urine and garbage. By the time you get to somebody's house, your feet are disgusting. So you go in the house. The lowest common slave in the house, their job, clean those feet. Jesus goes into a house with his disciples. They're all a little proud. None of them wants to do the dirty work. It's beneath them, we're the disciples. Who's the one that washes the feet? It's Jesus. So here he is, okay? And Jesus Christ is God. Prior to this, he was seated on a throne in heaven being worshiped by angels. And now he's picking dung out from underneath the toenails of Judas Iscariot. He didn't just wash the feet of the 11 good disciples. He also washed the feet of his own betrayer. The question is, does God not have more important things to do? Apparently, setting an example of humble, loving service is the most important thing for him to be doing at that moment. If Jesus is willing to wash feet, we should be willing to do dishes. If Jesus is willing to wash feet, we should be willing to vacuum. If Jesus is willing to wash feet, we should be willing to help the kids with their homework. If Jesus is willing to wash feet, we should be willing to do whatever loves those people that would call us husband or father. If you wanna change your marriage, if you really wanna be the leader, if you wanna earn respect, listen to the Lord and then serve. And um, I'll just close with this on my journal. Guys, I, there's a lot that I've screwed up. One thing was a great gift to me. It was maybe 20 years ago. One of the greatest men I've ever met in my entire life. Great business, great husband, great father, great ministry leader, world-class man of God. He's a business leader. I had the honor of meeting him. Uh, we became you know, acquaintances and I asked him, I said, uh, your life is really beautiful and blessed. I'm a young man. I don't, I don't, I mean, you're way down the road. Your business, your ministry, your family, like God's hand is all over your life. He's one of the greatest men I've ever met. And I asked him, I said, can I meet with you? He's like, yep. And uh, he said, uh, we're gonna meet here at this time. Don't be late, bring your questions. And what, he was respectful, but he's like, I'm gonna give you an hour, but make, you know, make it worth my time. Okay, so I prayed, I with grace, I wrote down questions. He's like, bring a journal. He told me, bring a journal, bring it. He always carried a journal. I always carried a Bible and a journal. And he's like, bring a journal and a pen. I'm like, okay. 
So I brought my prayer requests and my thoughts and my requests. We met. I, this will shock you, I shut up. I don't do that well. Um, I, just, I just asked questions and I listened and guess what I did when he said something? Guess what? I wrote it down. And then I'd ask another question, I write it down. And I write it down, I write it down. I was like, okay, business, parenting, kids, ministry, finances. Okay, hey, what about this? What about that? Anything else you think you should tell me? Any books I should read? Anything I should know? I wrote it all down. And then I asked him, I said, uh, I said, can I meet with you again sometime? Not every week, just, you know, when I feel like I got some questions and you could be helpful. He said, I'll always meet with you if you bring your journal, you pray and you're prepared, you write down what I tell you, and then you go do something. He's been a friend for decades. I really respect this man. And much of the good in my life and the things that have gone well started simply with me and the Holy Spirit, a journal and a pen. And I love you guys. And I'm so proud of you. And this is my favorite place to be and my favorite time to be with you. I believe God has greatness for you. I believe God has healing for you. I believe God has vision for you. I believe God has health for you. I believe that you are more powerful in the lives of others than you think you are. And I, I am absolutely convinced that with just a little bit of organization, effort and listening, the Holy Spirit is going to do incredible things in and through you. And people are gonna see the best version of you. I'm gonna pray and we'll spend some time in discussions. Father, thanks for an opportunity to teach. God, as simple as it sounds, sometimes we just need to turn our phone off, turn the radio off, turn the laptop off, turn the iPad off. Just sit down and listen. Hear from our Father. Talk to Him about some stuff. Process some stuff, plan some stuff, pray through some stuff. Lord, I thank you for the destiny that you have for all of these men. I thank you for the greatness that is in them because of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the people who depend on them. I thank you for the wives who need them, for the children who need them, for the grandchildren who need them, for the employees who need them, for the friends who need them. And Lord God, I pray that these men would hear from you. And I pray that they would listen and that they would plan and that they would obey. And God, I pray that as they record your instruction and direction, that they would see your provision and blessing. And Lord, I thank you that most of the amazing things in my incredible life just started with a piece of paper and a pen. And you spoke and then you blessed. And God, I thank you that even the church that we're in, the ministry that we have and our time together is the result of a journal entry many years ago that has now come to be a reality in Jesus' name. Love you guys. Thanks for letting me teach.